Hello there and welcome to MMA Fight Club. I'm your host, Manuel Galarza. Happy New Year, Merry Belated Christmas, all that good stuff. We are in now 2022. We're breaking down the full card here for Invicta Fighting Championships 45 coming up on the 12th of January with an 8 p.m. Eastern start time. Excited to break this card down. We've got six total bouts. For those who don't know, Invicta is female only, mixed martial arts, and they have one of the best features. Their scoring system is live, okay? So really encourage you to check out some of the Invicta, even past fights. It's nice to see the scoring between rounds. The fighters know where they stand. The main event will be a championship fight between Alicia Zapatella and Jessica Del Botani. This is a rematch for these two. Uh, Del Botani, excuse me. There's a rematch between the two fighters. This is a five-round event. Should be a good fight. It was a split decision win in the first time around for Alicia. So... We'll go over each fight, one fight at a time. We'll start with the first fight in the card, work our way up to the main event. Of course, if you want to skip forward, we have the timestamps there so you can skip over any fights you don't want to listen to. With all that said, let's jump into it. Here we go, guys. The first fight in the card should be a flyweight bout at 125 pounds between two American fighters, Helen Peralta and Elise Pone. Elise the Peace Pone is 1-0 and overall. This will be her second total mixed martial arts bout, and at 36 years old, she's gotten a little bit of a late start to her career. Nonetheless, she hails from State College, Pennsylvania, the home of the Nittany Lions. That's Penn State University. She still lives there and trains out of Central PA Mixed Martial Arts. At 5'8", Elise is going to have a 7-inch height advantage here over Peralta, who stands at 5'1". And with a 70-inch reach, Elise will also have a 5-inch reach advantage. Now, looking here at Helen Peralta, who goes by Lanza, she's got dual citizenship from both the Dominican Republic and the United States, grew up in New York City, 4-2 and two overall. She's now based out of Iowa, where she trains under Sergio Cunha. I couldn't say, find the name of the gym, but Sergio Cunha, C-U-N-H-A, is the name of, I guess, her main instructor, her coach, and that's somewhere in Iowa. 33 years old for Peralta, so 30 year, three years younger than Pone. And again, we mentioned the height and reach disadvantage. So looking here at the fighters uh, side by side, some comparisons. In terms of pro experience, Elise Pone went pro seven months ago. So not much pro experience compared to four years of pro experience for Helen Peralta. Um, in terms of their fighting styles, Elise Pone is a Muay Thai fighter. That's that's her base. She fought approximately, I believe, 13 or 14 Thai, thai boxing, uh, kickboxing matches and went 13 and one, something like that. That was her record. So she's got a Thai background and a Muay Thai stance. As for Helen Peralta, she stands heavy on her feet and is really more or less a prototypical boxer. She wants to slug with you. She wants to hit you with heavy hands and she does have striking power. That's one of her big strengths. For, for her weaknesses for Helen Peralta, it's experience. Like she has fought a few good people. You're going to be surprised the names that we've that she's fought as we're going to talk about her topology. But she still needs more experience. And at age 33, it's like, you know, it's now or never. Same goes for Elise Pone. She doesn't have much experience either, but she's getting started here undefeated with 1-0 record. She does have a speed disadvantage, I believe, in this matchup. I believe when you look at Elise Pone on film, and there's only one fight to look at because she's only 1-0, I believe that she's a bit of a slow fighter, and again, she's longer, taller, not doesn't have that quickness that you see with someone like Helen, but her striking, at least Pone that is, is her strength. Long arms, long legs, if she can reach her opponent at a distance, that could be a path to her for, for her to victory. Now, looking at tapology, looks like Peralta is the favorite, getting 82% of the votes here, only 18% of the votes coming in for Pone. I get it. Um, I like Peralta to win the fight too, but it's not just because uh, she's got four and two record or six fights compared to one. It's the quality of opponent, which we're going to talk here about. Helen Peralta, who's, as we mentioned before, has dual citizenship, raised in New York City. She's actually a pastry a pastry chef by um, by a profession, okay? And she's also a culinary arts instructor. So she looks to obviously go down that road when she finishes up with her mixed martial arts career. But she's into pastry, into culinary arts. Um, she got into mixed martial arts late in life in part because she was doing that as a career. And then she watches the Ronda Rousey versus Holly Holmes fight. And it's like, I like mixed martial arts. I want to start working out and doing this. Next thing you know, here she is an Invicta, right? Um, nine and one amateur record, so very good amateur record. Again, even though she doesn't have a lot of pro fights, only six fights total, she did have a good amateur record. She's two and zero in bare knuckle fighting. You don't see that very often on a female fighter's resume. Two and zero in bare knuckle fighting. Um, she's four and one in Invicta and zero and one in CFFC. The one loss she had in CFFC, though, which is a very good promotion, was a split decision loss. So Helen Peralta, by all intents and purposes, very good fighter, pretty good experience. Even with the only six six fights total, there have been good six quality fights. Now notable opponents. Here's where it was an eye-opener for me. She beat Cheyenne Vlismus, aka Cheyenne Bays, by decision in 2018 in Invicta and it wasn't like, oh, a shady decision. No, she beat her. She beat her up. She knocked her down twice in that fight and one of the, I'm sorry, was it once or twice? One time for sure clean where she knocks her down. It's not an off-balance shot. She just kind of buzzes Cheyenne. Cheyenne does a great job, survives, go back to the feet. So it was a nice win back, what, three, four years ago at this at this time. Now, she also fought UFC fighter Kay Hansen, and she lost her TKO round three, 2018. Hansen and Cheyenne are both current UFC fighters. So 
from that standpoint, you know, she's got things in her background, in her resume that clearly Elise Pone has not, you know, had a chance to experience yet. Now, the positive I'd like about Helen Peralta, she's only been finished one time in her career, and that was by Kay Hansen, UFC level fighter. She's faced, obviously, UFC level ca caliber fighters compared to Elise Pone, who has not. Um, she's an active fighter. Helen Peralta is averaging just about, she did two, well, she fought twice in 2021, she fought once in 2020, and twice in 2019. You got to give her a break 2020 because the whole COVID thing. But still, in the last three years, she's fighting almost two fights a year. So very active as a fighter. Very powerful hands. I think Helen Peralta, her most dangerous weapon or her best weapon is the ability to hurt her opponents. She knocked down Cheyenne Bays or Vlismus. Cheyenne Vlismus is a tough fighter. Very durable. A little crazy. Goes forward, works forward, works forward pace. In that fight, Helen dropped her ass. So my concerns with Helen, um, she's still in search of a recent signature win. Now, the, I'm talking about recent, meaning like now. Like, what will she do in 2022? Will she get a few good wins in Invicta? Will she get the title? Will you know? Will she make a run? Um, she had those wins. It was a while ago. Um, will she do anything here in, in her in her recent you know type of history? So I'm looking forward to seeing what she does here with this this match and seeing what she does down the road. Now, another thing about Helen Peralta that concerns me: she came up short in a split decision loss to Gallardo, 2021, and that was the split decision loss in CFC. When you lose split decision losses, the concern for me is that maybe the judges don't see your fighting style as valuable. They don't give you the points. They're just not seeing you um, do your job the way that maybe you think you're doing your job. So that always concerns me. I know I'm splitting hairs here. I don't have much to go on for ter in terms of Helen Peralta, in terms of negatives. I like her game. I like her in this matchup. I, I'm going to I'm gonna project that the money line will probably open around minus 350 to minus 400. I'm just guesstimating. I don't have a money line yet for this for officially, but I'm going to guess minus 350-ish will be the line where, where it's going to be at for Helen. So I believe she's a significant favorite here over Elise Pohn with only one fight under her belt. So uh, with that said, let's talk about Elise Pohn. So she grew up, like I said, in Penn State area university. Um, she began Muay Thai at the age of 12 years old along with wrestling. 13 and 1 Muay Thai kickboxing record, a BJJ pur purple belt, uh, black belt in Muay Thai, and she's 1 and 0 in Invicta. Now, in terms of her pros, things I like about her, her kicking game, her reach, um, she's going to obviously have a reach advantage here, but even if the fighter, let's say, was the same reach as her, she fights long, she just has long length, almost like karate a little bit, but that Muay Thai, you know, fighting style. Very athletic and had an athletic youth, so was involved with sports, was doing things as a kid. Long striker. When I, I want to emphasize this, like she really gets reach. She extends all the way out in her reach. That could be a positive and a negative against Helen. Helen's going to have to close the distance, get in tight, make it an ugly fight, dirty boxing, which I'm sure she will do. My concerns about Elise Pohn, some of them are obvious. Very little experience. And in the one fight that I watched with her fighting against Chrissy, um, was it Chrissy? Make sure I'm saying that correctly. Yes, against Chrissy Yandoli. In that fight, I felt as if, like, Chrissy Yandoli is an okay level fighter. But Yandoli was slow and wasn't taking advantage of the fact that Elise Pone doesn't have the best head movement. It's slow, it's not very active, and so I fear with Helen Peralta, who is quick, you know, much quicker, I believe, than Elise Pone, will get in there close and will take advantage of the lack of head movement there from Elise Pone. So for Elise Pone, this is by far her hardest competition. For Helen Peralta, I don't think this is her toughest competition. She's fought two people recently that are in the UFC. So for Helen Peralta, if she just does what she does, she should come out of here with a win and possibly may even finish the fight. The film that we watched to break down this fight, um, the film of the prior fights, we watched Peralta versus Lismus, 2018, Peralta versus Ripley, 2018, and Pone versus Yandoli, 2021. Those three fights, as usual, as you can expect, those links are in the description. You can watch those fights yourself. Looking at a few more notes I have in the two fighters here side by side, I give Helen Peralta an experience and IQ advantage here over Elise Pone. I think they're both about the same cardio-wise. They look to be in very good shape. They look to be working very hard, have pretty good respective gyms. Finishing-wise, I do give an advantage to Helen Peralta. I believe she hits significantly harder, and that will be the difference in this fight, whether it's to be finishing the fight or because she wins a round because of the harder punches. Now, um, boxing-wise, I also give an advantage to Helen Peralta. I think Elise Pone is a good striker. She's just not as fast as Peralta. Peralta's got a nice high guard. She stands very heavy on her feet. She's looking to box. If you ask Helen Peralta where you went to fight, she would take the fight the entire time in the middle of the cage on their feet toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Elise Pone, that's probably where she's best too. But man, that's also where Helen Peralta's best. So it's going to be a little bit of a problem there for Pone. Now, the last part at grappling, I do think as well, Helen Peralta naturally, based upon her shorter physique, will be able to get her chin under Pone's chin if they go up against the cage. Pone is a very, very long... I'm trying to think of an example of a male fighter that would compare to her, but the point is she's very, very long, okay, and very thin, and so, yes, striking is to her advantage, almost like an Ignacio Bahamundes, right? Imagine Ignacio Bahamundes getting, like, three takedowns and grappling somebody for, for three rounds. No, Bahamundes is a striker. He's long. That's the way I see Elise Pone. She's in that same type of, you know, realm. So 
With all that said, I am on Helen Peralta to win the fight. I think she comes in here and does a good job. The money line is going to be a little chalky. If you find a book that allows you to parlay this, that might be the angle because you're not going to go ahead and put up minus 300 or so on, on a female fight opening this, this card. And I was a little surprised about that too. Surprised that Helen Peralta that her fight was all the way down as the opening fight on the card. I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying, I, I feel like she's a better fighter than that. Maybe she should have been late in the card. Maybe they have a reason for it. Whatever. Anyway, I like Helen Peralta to win the fight. Good luck with this one, guys. Next fight in the card is going to be an atomweight bout between Tabitha Ann Watkins, the American fighter, and Katie Sal from Canada. Now, Katie Sal goes by Queen of the North. She's 3-5 and five overall. It says currently on Tapology that she hails out of Dublin, Ireland, which makes sense. I heard that she's been training at SBG Ireland, even though on Tapology it says she trains at Winnipeg Academy of Mixed Martial Arts. Either way, both good gyms, both gyms with UFC-level fighters in them. Sal is 34 years old, 5'4 in height, with a 63.5-inch reach. Now, as for Tabitha Ann Watkins, who goes by Batgirl, the American fighter is from Michigan. She's 3-3 three three overall as a professional. Side note, she's also 3-3 three three as an amateur. 27 years old, so about 6, 7 years younger here than uh, Sal. 5'3", so 1 inch shorter than Sal, with a 63-inch reach, so about the same reach um, as the other fighter. And now, Ann Watkins is training out of Sc Scorpion Fighting Systems. Very good gym. Um, just a little side note, Michelle Pereira coming up on UFC Vegas 46. That fight card, he's out of Scorpion Fighting Systems. So very good gym there. And I would say if the gym choice for me between Winnipeg Academy or Scorpion Fighting Systems, I'd lean towards Watkins. But again, it seems as if Katie Sal might be training out of SBG Ireland, which is a phenomenal gym. Now, according to Tapology, Watkins is getting the votes here. About 60% of the votes are coming in for Watkins and about 40% are coming in for Sal. I get it. This is probably going to open as a pick when the money line is released. The money line is currently not available. I've looked high and wide. I can't find it. I'm going to guesstimate that Tabitha Watkins will be a slight favorite around minus 120 to minus 140 in that range when it opens up with Katie Sewell on the other side being around plus 105 to plus 125. And it is a fight that has a ton of variables. They are evenly matched. When the fight's over, hindsight's 2020, someone's going to probably be like, oh, you know, I could see that. That's easy. Now I can see who's going to win the fight. But going into this fight, there are so many variables. It's very hard to pick and choose which fighter is better at what. Now, looking at some basic information on the fighters, pro experience, Tabitha Watkins has been a pro for about four and a half years. Katie's been a pro for about five years, so comparable. Watkins is using a karate style. When she's fresh, start of the fight, kicking, a lot of kicking. I like her kicking, very flexible, gets her head kicks up easily, body kicks, leg kicks. As the fight wears on, I believe she fatigues, and obviously the kicking game sort of goes with it, right? But karate, stance, wide stance, um, side stance, balance, good position. Um, as for Katie Sewell, Boxer through and through. She actually fought 35 boxing matches before she got into mixed martial arts. Now, those are 35, I believe, I want to say amateur boxing matches, but the point is she's got boxing experience, so when she fights, she's a boxer. Chin tucked in, guards up nice and high. She does kick too, and she's a very long fighter, so it, it lends that, you know, even though she's at atom weight division, but she's long looking, you know, she's got long legs, but the kicking is not a very active part of her game. She's more of a puncher, so again, prototypical boxer in the case of Katie Sal. Now, for the strengths of Katie Sal, her striking is her strength. She's not very good at grappling. She's very weak on the ground. She's weak against takedown defense. The same goes for Tabitha Watkins. Very weak wrestler. Got taken down many times in her recent fights. We'll talk about those fights in particular, but she's not good at takedown defense and not good on the ground. Now, Tabitha Watkins has some decent submission ability when she's on her back, but sometimes she kind of depends upon that too much and will give up, obviously, the ultimate position for submission scenario, right? So for Tabitha Watkins, her strength is her kicking. I do think her kicking is special. It's what makes her unique. I think if she can land something, she can knock somebody out. If she can keep the volume up in round two and three, it can be a deciding factor for her to win the fight. Now, looking here at some notes I have on the fighters, let's talk here first about Tabitha and Watkins. Again, from Michigan, she was a multi-sport athlete in high school, played soccer, basketball, and if you're from Michigan, you ski, the ski team. When I read that, I was like, yeah, we don't have that over here where I'm from in New York and Pennsylvania. Actually, that's not true. If you're probably from upstate New York, they probably do have ski teams, but I'm from the city area, like Brooklyn. We didn't have any ski teams in Brooklyn. She attended Eastern Michigan University. I don't know if she graduated. Her training partner is Alicia Zapatella, who was fighting in the main card of this event, so you may have heard of her. She's the current champion, so that's her training partner. She was 3-3 three and three as an amateur, and there's some interesting stats here on her. The combined record of her three wins as an amateur, those opponents, right, was 2-9. and nine. She beat Brie Brassaw, who was 2-4, and four, Maria Hammond, 0-1, Sheena Brandberg, 0-4. So the three wins she has as an amateur were against opponents who had a combined 2-9 and nine record, and then obviously she lost three, three fights. She went pro in 2017. She's 3-3 three and three as a pro. Now check this out. Now this is an indictment. 
I don't know. If this is not an indictment on somebody's record, I don't know what it is. And I'm not talking personally. I don't have anything against Tabitha Watkins. I've had a few fighters recently either like direct message me or post things like it's not personal. It's not. I'm just reading the numbers here. Okay. Tabitha Watkins is three and three as a pro. The combined record of her three wins, their opponents, those opponents is one and 14. The three wins that she has, those opponents are 1-14. Rachel Smith, 0-4. Rachel Zazoff, 1-9. And, and Carmen Milagros, 0-1. So, just you know, putting this in context, she's got six total wins in her career from amateur to pro, and she has never beat somebody with a better than 500 record. Never. <laughs> okay? She's 0-1 in Bellator. She lost to Van Zant in 2009 via round two TKO. And that was a weak TKO. I felt like they called it too quickly. She was getting beat up. I don't know. I, she was fighting back. Probably should have let the fight keep going, but she did lose the fight. It was Bellator experience, though. The positives I like about Tabitha Watkins, she does have an athletic background. I tend to favor a little bit fighters that have at least some athletics when they were younger. I feel like the fighters who are like, oh, I went to college and I got a job and I started working in accounting and then I was like, I need to go work out because I'm getting fat and I started, I'm now, I'm now on the UFC. That kind of gives me a weird vibe sometimes. I feel like those type of people, it's two different types. Either one, legit, like somebody who was like harboring athleticism and just didn't find out until later on. They got it to be, a, you know, be an adult and they took it serious and they, they do great. They do great. I'm, I'm not questioning those people. The other side is like, yo, like you haven't really been an athlete your whole life. You don't really know the ins and outs of what it takes, the seasonal training, the injuries, the recovery, the process, the growth over years and years and years. And so you think it's just like, put on the gloves and go fight. So um, with that said, I, I, I think that in her case, um, she does have a background in athletics, multi-sport multi, multi, multi -sport athlete. She seems very athletic in the octagon. When you watch her fight, she is out there lighting the feet quick. Um, and of course, they're both quick. It's Adam Waits, right? Anyway, she started her career off 3-0 and as a pro before her last three straight losses. So she is on a three-fight losing streak. She's at a good gym, as we mentioned. The head of the gym there would be Michelle Pereira in the UFC. You got Josh Parisian, UFC, Colin Anglin in the UFC, and then Alicia Zapatella, who's the champion there in Invicta. So she's got a good gym, good training partners. My concerns with Tabitha Watkins are very low-level competition, as we discussed. Never beat somebody with a better than 500-level le record. She's on a three-fight losing streak, four fights if you count her exhibition bout that she recently fought as well, which kind of shows up weird in tapology. It's, it's there, but it's an exhibition bout. She's been finished four times between her amateur and pro career. That's a lot of times being finished as an atom weight. I'm just going to be honest with you. And the amount of fights she's fought, you know, six total pro fights, um, and she fought six total amateur fights, and she's been finished four total times. She hasn't won a fight in almost three years. Damn it. You know, that's tough. It's tough when you're losing column. You can't get a W. For Tabitha right now, the struggle is real. She hasn't won a fight in almost three years. She pulls guard, in my opinion, too much. The um, the epitome of you know submission, um, giving up submission for I mean giving I'm sorry, <laughs> giving up position for submission opportunities. We all know that little lingo there. She does that too much. She'll pull guard and then she'll be on her back for long periods of time. And look, you're losing the round that way. Now her takedown defense is is horrible. Uh, so is Katie Sewell, so they'll both be well-versed in that area of probably not taking each other down. If someone does get a takedown, they'll probably get back up. Again, their takedown offense, their defense, their grappling, all of the wrestling components of their game are very weak. For Tabitha Watkins, um, she got easily taken down by Van Zant. Like, Van Zant was able to take her down with ease, didn't even try. And it was almost like Tabitha just fell down and pulled guard. She almost got submitted at the end of the first round against Van Zant, and they got, ended up getting beat up by Van Zant TKO'd in the second round. She got taken down easily in her fight against Carmen Milagros, 2019. It was a hip toss, like a neck crank hip toss. And then once she's down, that's Tabitha, she can't get back up. Now, as for Katie Sal, the Canadian. So, she did have amateur boxing experience. We mentioned this, 35 total amateur boxing fights. So, she's been in the, ca the cage, ring, octagon, whatever, more than the 3-5 and five record suggests. With that said, she is 3-5 and five as a mixed martial artist. You would think that the boxing background would have helped her when she came into mixed martial arts. I don't know how much it has. Anyway, she started her career off 0-2. She's got no amateur mixed martial arts experience. She has amateur boxing experience. She's a southpaw. I noticed that in the film. So that's always tricky for someone who's traditional stance like Sabbath Watkins. So for Katie, she'll come out in a southpaw stance. She likes to lead with a nice long jab. You see the boxing technique. Um, I don't love her head movement. She kind of dips her head always to the left. Um, but you can see that she's a pretty good bo boxer. She's got a good gym, whether it's at Winnipeg uh, Academy or whether it's over in SBG Island. Both good gyms. My concerns here on Katie Sewell, she's on a three-fight losing streak. She's three and five in her last eight fights. That's her obviously pro record, three and five. She hasn't won a fight in almost four years. 
Combined between Tabitha and Katie, these two ladies have unfortunately not won a fight in almost seven years combined. It is what it is, right? Her wrestling and grappling is not very good, but that goes for both fighters. I would imagine if one of these two fighters actually spent some time wrestling and grappling and like shored up that part of their game, they probably can come in here and get an easy victory just by getting one or two takedowns because both of them are not very good with takedown defense or offense grappling of any kind. Now, the fights we watched here to break down this film, we watched Tabitha Watkins versus Van Zant. That link's in the description. Tabitha Watkins versus Delbani the second. Delbani's obviously fighting the main event. We watched that fight. That's also linked in the description. Tabitha Watkins versus Milagros. Sal versus Anderson and Sal versus Van Zant. All five of those links are in the description so you can watch those fights at your leisure. Just a few more points here before we finish up here. Side-by-side -side experience wise, I give no edge to either fighter here because they've only fought, what, six, seven fights, eight fights respectively between the two of them. IQ wise, the same level of IQ, I believe, in the ring. Cardio-wise, again, pretty much equal. Finishing-wise, I just don't see an edge for either fighter. Boxing-wise, I guess Katie Sewell is the actual boxer, so she maybe has some better boxing. And then on the flip side, I'd give Tabitha Watkins a slight edge in grappling where I could see her maybe possibly attempting some submissions. Look, this fight is one of the lowest level fights that I have ever broken down in my damn life. And I'm not saying that out of disrespect. I'm just saying... You got fighters here with both of them at 500 or 500 or lower than 500 records. Their opponents we've talked about. So anything is possible. I would highly recommend not wagering on this fight. If you're going to wager, you put a gun to my head. I'm taking Katie Sal. Now I'm taking Katie Sal with the even worse record than three and three, you know, Tabitha Watkins. And yes, she's seven years older. I just really, really have some concerns about Tabitha Watkins and like, you know, what she's gotten into recently in her fighting style. Now, with all that said, <clears throat> Tap the Watkins can win the fight with high volume kicking, keep the fight at a distance, look good, look sharp. She can win the fight that way. Katie Sal, it's almost the same exact remedy. Keep the fight at a distance, use your length, <clears throat> use some kicking, kick the legs, kick the body. This fight will come down to probably who has the cleaner few punches in the round. So you can see an entire, let's say, three and a half, four minutes go by in a round. You're not sure who won that round. And then last 15, 20 seconds of the round, Tabitha Walken comes in, lands a, a front kick or something, or pushes down Katie Sewell, or just catches her some way, bam, she gets the round. So the one thing you got to like about Invicta is the fight score is current. It's, it's, it's up to date. It's between rounds. You know what the score is. The fighters know what if they won round one or they lost round one, if they won or lost round two. So you got to like that part of this fight. I imagine this fight is going to be obnoxiously close. It's going to be interesting. Um, I have no dogs in this fight, but if I'm going to bet on it, I guess I'm siding with Katie Saw with that slight, slight plus money that I think will come out when the, when the line opens. Now, if this thing opens up, pick them like 110, 110 each side. Not surprised either. This is a very interesting fight. I look forward to watching it. Good luck, guys. Next fight in the card is going to be a bantamweight bout at 135 pounds between the Mexican Maria Jose Favela and Sarah Kleska from the United States. Kleska goes by Chucky. She's 2-3 and three overall. She's fighting out of Tampa, Florida, specifically out of American Top Team. Very good gym. She's about to be 29 years old. 5 foot 6 in height with 66 inch reach. As for Favela, who goes by Leona, she's 2 and 1 overall in her career, so very inexperienced. 28 years old in 10 months, so also about to be 29 years old. 5 7 in height with 66 and a half inch reach. She's training out of Entrum Gym, which is where Brandon Moreno trains. So both fighters are coming out of very good gyms and very little experience. Now, according to Tapology, Favela is coming in as a big favorite, getting 95% of the votes here on Tapology. Only 5% of the votes are, votes are coming in for the American fighter, Kleska. Now, according to the money line, it is also favoring Favela at minus 310. You can get Sarah Kleska on the other side at plus 250. I like Sarah Kleska as my dogger pass on this card. I'm only going to use one dogger pass for the entire card. I'm choosing Sarah Kleska as my dogger pass. I think she's got a good gym. There's variables on both fighters we're going to talk about. But at plus 250, it is very attractive. If this was closer to pick a money or like minus 150 to minus 175, I might feel more imp you know, imp inclined to maybe take a stab at Maria Jose Favela. But at like a half a unit and a quarter unit here at plus 250 and a women's bout between two fighters who have a lot of holes in their game, I think you're on the big value side at the at the plus 250 side. So we're going to talk more about it here. Looking at the fighters side by side, fighting style, kickboxing style for Maria Jose Favela. Now, at times, she looks more like just a standard boxer. I will say that. As the fight goes on, her feet come closer together. She's standing more in a traditional boxing stance. The chin is tucked down, guards up nice and high. But earlier in the fight, when she's a little more athletic, she tends to spread her legs out, more of a kickboxing stance, and will throw more kicks. As for Sarah Kleska, <clears throat> Not the quickest fighter in any way, shape, or form, so not too far apart with the legs. Legs a little closer together, more of a standard just boxer 
uh, stance. It looks like that in every part of her fight. So it's not like she'll change things up. They both fight in orthodox stance, so they're right-handed, left-hand lead. Okay, now in terms of combinations for, for Maria Jose Favela, that is her strong suit. She does throw nice combinations, especially in the fight. So like head-to-body combinations, not so much with the feet, but arm, com I mean, hand combinations. So body shots, head shots, the whole nine, elbows. She fights very good in the clinch, very good in dirty boxing. For Sarah Klezga, her strong suit is her size and her length. And I don't think the size here in these two fighters is accurate. It says 5'7 for Maria, F uh, for Maria Favela and 5'6 for Klezga. I think, in my opinion, is going to be the taller fighter and she'll have the longer reach. I can't prove it. I don't know it for sure. But from watching film, I found it really hard to believe that the Mexican fighter, Favela, is taller than Sarah Kleska. So I'm just saying it offhand. I hope I'm right, but I think Kleska is going to have the size and length advantage, longer legs, longer arms, and a taller fighter. That could play a role. Sarah's not a great striker, does a striking combination, but when she does strike, like spinning back fists and whatnot, she's landing some of those punches in prior fights. It does look pretty good. Now, the disadvantage for Sarah Kleska, her biggest weakness, I believe, is her speed. She lacks quickness and athleticism. Not sure where that's coming from. Is that fatigue? Is that, is that, is that hesitancy? Um, is it a physiological, physiological thing? I'm not sure. Now, Favela, her weakness is inactivity and experience, though both fighters lack experience. Let's talk here now more details about the two fighters. We'll start with Maria Jose Favela first. From Mexico, 4-1 as an amateur. She's actually a chef by trait. That's actually what her, like, I guess um, she claims that she's a chef. Put it that way. She wants to open up a Mexican-French fusion restaurant someday. So she's got plans, wants to be an entrepreneur. This fighting thing is, I guess, temporary for her. Now, her amateur career, she was 4-1 overall. Very impressive, right? But she is 0-1 in Invicta, all right? And she is 2-1 as a pro. So not as successful yet as a pro as she was in am as an amateur. The positives I like here are Maria Jose Favela. She's never been finished as an amateur or a pro, okay? And that's what, five, six, seven, eight, eight total fights. Her only pro loss is against an undefeated prospect, Jose, I'm uh, sorry, Jose, Josie uh, Stewart, who's 3-0 and overall. And that was a close fight. It was decision loss, but still good loss, right? Quality loss. She's at Entrim Gym, as I mentioned before. She's training with Brandon Moreno and a lot of very good Mexican Central American fighters. So excellent gym, getting her ready for this fight. She's a decent grappler against defense. Good defense against uh, takedowns against defense when she's up against defense. And then dirty boxing, elbows, knees in tight, when she, especially when she's fresh. Her, her boxing inside the clinch is excellent. Elbows, body shots, knees to the, knees to the body. I love it. Um, decent grappler, like I said, overall. Though she can get taken down at times. In one of her recent fights against Stewart, you saw that's why she lost the fight. She couldn't get up off the ground at times, and she got taken down too much. Now, she did win the second round of the fight against Stewart. I'm going to talk about that round. Because she lost round one and round three on every judge's scorecards, but she won round two on every judge's scorecards. Why did she win round two? She defended the takedowns. She was effective with her dirty boxing. And she landed a few nice straight punches when they were out in the middle of the cage. Round one, round two, she got wrestled to the ground and she couldn't get up, couldn't get distance, couldn't land punches. Will that happen against Sarah Kleska? Probably not. Sarah Kleska's not much of a wrestler either, but I'm just saying, in that fight for Maria Jose Favela, she did win round two, and it was because she changed her approach, defended the takedowns, kept the fight in the feet. Now, my concerns with Favela, her takedown defense is not good. Many times in that fight, when she needed to stay on her feet, she could not. So, will Sarah take her down? Again, no, but I'm just pointing out the, con the concerns I have with Maria Fo Jose Favela, Favela's game. Now, she lost a split decision in her MMA debut as an amateur, mind you. It was about four and a half, five years ago. She was fighting an opponent called Jessica, her name was Jessica Artavia. Now, Jessica Artavia is 0-2 as, as a pro, 2-4 and 4 as an amateur, and has suffered four straight losses between her pro and amateur career. When you watch that fight, the link's in the description. Now, it's back in 2017-ish, 2017, right? Uh, Maria Jose Favela wins the fight by split decision it was very close and maria's boxing did not look great her cardio didn't look great she looked a little overweight actually in that fight that was her mixed martial arts amateur pro debut um and our amateur debut and again that just sort of to me kind of turns me off it concerns me like how good of a striker is maria you know how good overall is she i'm not saying sarah's amazing but again you got maria jose favela here at minus 310 on the money line that's a very big favorite that's like three to one favorite obviously we're you know doing hard math here right um so for maria jose favela one more thing on her she can get off balance when she starts putting too much into her punches. It happened against Stewart, where the fight in third round was close. We had 1-1, one, one, round one, round two. Round three, she's trying to, like, overpunch. She's looking for the overkill. Gets off balance, gets taken down. How can that be a problem here against Sarah Kleska? Only problem would be that if she gets off balance and then Sarah Kleska, like, pulls off from spinning back fists like she's done before, gets other fighters, and then, like, hurts Maria. 
but not sure that happens. And I'm not sure Sarah's quick enough to make that happen. Now, as for Sarah Klesga, she's from Georgia, 7-0 and as an amateur fighter, so good record. She went 9-0 and to start her entire mixed martial arts career between amateur and pro. So started off 2-0 and and then uh, hit a wall. Now she's had three straight losses in a row. Anyway, she went pro 2017, so been a pro for about four and a half, five years. She's never been finished, so neither fighter has been finished. She has one so sub win on her career as a pro and several as an amateur. So she does have some submission ability. Now, big concerns I have with her. Three-year layoff between her last two fights. So not the last fight. Last fight was 2021. But before that, it was three freaking years, you know. So she's averaging two fights over the last three years. Not busy enough. You want to see more activity. She's on a losing streak, as we mentioned. She lost to Cloudy, split decision 2021 as a main event for the Apex title. She lost to Victoria, 2018 by decision, and Verosa, 2018 by decision. So three losses in a row. She's trying to obviously break that trend. Um, Sarah Kleska does not have good boxing technique where the punches are coming straight down the line. Everything is looping. I mean, sometimes it looks like her, her wrist is even curled. Like, it's just it's very odd. Um, not a lot of power behind her punches. I'm sorry to say. I just don't see much power there. Now, why do I like her to win? I like that plus money. I want to say it again. This is a women's fight. Who knows what the hell happens here? I think it's ugly. I think it's close. And you want to be on the plus money side if you're looking to win the fight. Now, if you had to put a gun to my head, yeah, maybe Maria is probably going to win the fight. Better striking, you know, cleaner striking, more volume, more combinations. But that minus 310 is scary. It's just too chalky for me to get on. So I'm talking about in one world, it's like Maria probably wins the fight, right? But at minus 310, probably is not good enough, man. It's just not good enough, right? So back to the notes here I have on Sarah um, Kleska. She throws looping punches, like I said, slow striker, slow counter striker. She will get outboxed, outstriked by any good kickboxer, boxer who's sharp and throws combinations. That's probably Maria Jose Favela. As I'm saying this, I'm realizing why am I picking Dogger Pass on Sarah Kleska? Because she's an American of America. You know, shout out to all of our North American brothers and sisters, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, everybody. But look, I like Sarah Kleska here as a Dogger Pass. I think she's got a shot here. The fights we watch in the two fighters, we watch Kleska versus Cloudy 2021. We watched Favela vs. Stortz, 2021, and then we also watched that Favela fight from years ago when she was just an amateur. It was Favela vs. Um, give me a second here, going back, back, back. Favela vs. Jessica Artavia Tijanero. That was back in 2017, split decision win. If you watch that fight, I know it's four or five years ago, but that's not that long ago. And I'm like, man, has Maria Jose Favela made that much of an improvement since then? Maybe, maybe she has, but not enough for me to decide to be with 310, for example, minus 310 on the money line. So anyway, last time, just to summarize, I do like Sarah to win. Oh, one more thing, side-by-side -side comparisons. Experience-wise, 2-1 two and, ver two and one versus 2-3, two and three, very little experience. IQ-wise, I give them both a very low rating because this is very new for them. They're still trying to find their way. They haven't fought anybody notable, have no notable wins, have fought nobody, you know, good opponents, nobody in Bellator, nobody like high-level Invicta opponents, nothing of that nature. So uh, cardio-wise, they both look decent in round three, four-ish of their fight, um, but I'm not sure. Like, for example, Mario Jose Favela looked a little slow at times in her fight, but then finished strong. Um, Sarah Kleska always looks slow, so I'm not sure if she's tired or not. Uh, finishing ability, they both lack finishing ability. Boxing-wise, a small edge there for Maria Jose Favela. She's quicker, and she throws combinations, whereas Sarah Kleska does not have really any boxing technique. Grappling-wise, I think it's equal. Both fighters should look to keep the fun the feet. So, two 28-year-old fighters about to be 29. Good matchup. We'll see what happens. Very low-low in mixed martial arts. If you want to pass all together and not bet on it, might be a good move. Good luck with this one, guys. Hello there and welcome to MMA Fight Club. I'm your host, Manny Galarza. We're breaking down the featherweight fight here at 145 pounds between Courtney King Leon from the United States and Romana Pasquale from Hong Kong. Now, forgive me, most of us Westerners can be a little geographically challenged. Hong Kong is not China and China is not Hong Kong. There's like a sort of separation of entities there where Hong Kong is like a nation inside of China. Yeah, whatever that makes sense. But anyway, Pasquale is from Hong Kong. We're going to talk more about her because she has an interesting little path here to how she has gotten to this fight, specifically her training regimen. So Pasquale, five and two overall, three and two in her last five fights, 33 years old, five foot seven in height with 66 inch reach. She's out of syndicate MMA. So even though she hails from Hong Kong, we're going to talk about her move over to Syndicate. Now, as for Courtney King, the Lion, she's 4-2 and two overall. She hails from Fort Collins, Colorado, where she's still based out of and still trains. 5'9", in height, so Twitch is taller here than Romana. 
with a 69 inch reach, so three inch advantage there for Courtney King, which should play into her benefit and could pose a problem here at some point to pass. Well, um, now King is out of Z's training gym. It is a factor. I'm not going to beat up a dead horse here, but Syndicate MMA is a much more established gym, much better training partners and coaches. Z's training gym, from what I could find, is a very small gym in Fort Collins, Colorado, with no other fighters in the gym, no other mixed martial artists that are, that are fighting for Bellator or any other LFA, nothing, nothing I could find. So if I'm wrong on that, I do apologize to Courtney King um, and her her fan base. Now, according to the public vote here, Courtney King is getting 64% of the votes, only 36% of the votes coming in for Pasquale. A little surprised, but I think that's because a few factors. One, Ramona Pasquale is an Asian fighter. 2021 was a rough year. If you just bet against all the Asian Chinese fighters in 2021, within any type of mixed martial arts promotion, you did well. So there's that factor. Secondly, there's not much to, there's not much out there about Ramona Pasquale. You have to really dig. Now, we provided two links in the description for actual interviews of her, along with two links for some prior fights of hers. But again, it's, it's grainy. It's tough to get a grasp. One of the fights is the 2018 Muay Thai fight that didn't even show up on her topology, and her opponent looks like she's at least 40 pounds lighter than her. So again, a little tough there to get a full grasp on what Romana Pasquale is capable of. We'll talk about what we've seen on film with her, but I do understand why topology could be on the side here of Courtney King, who is a little bit more known of a fighter who has possibly fought some better competition here. Looking at the side-by-side -side comparison to these two fighters, the fighting style for Courtney King is that of a boxer. She stands very tall. Um, I want to make sure this breakdown is not disrespectful because I, I like Courtney King. Nothing wrong with a person, but she just seems to be a little slow in the cage. Um, just slow. So slow responsiveness. Now she's a boxer by trait, like she stands up tall, but her reaction time seems to be slow and her boxing technique is not great. But she doesn't stand like a Muay Thai fighter, a karate fighter, doesn't grapple very much. So ultimately, I've kind of pinned her into being a boxer, right? Her style. For Mona Pascal, her style is Muay Thai. She's very good with her knees. It's one of her strong points. She likes to flight in the clinch. Good tripping game. She's fought Muay Thai bouts before, so it makes sense that she's got a Muay Thai stance. For Courtney King, one of her best attributes, I mean, for lack of better words, her toughness. Um, the fight that she fought, her most recent fight, where she came out of there looking like a bloody mess. Kayla Harrison, 2020. Okay, so almost two years ago now, she fought Kayla Harrison. And of course, look, Kayla Harrison is, you know, PFL champ, amazing, you know, making a bunch of money, doing her thing. But in that fight, Kayla Harrison lands an elbow early against Courtney King on the ground. Courtney King is so bloodied up. I don't think I've ever seen that much blood on a person's face. When she gets up off the mat between rounds, it's like the bl the blood already co coagulated on her face. It was like already, dr not drying, but like it was stuck. It was like matted blood all over her face. And you can hear the corner, I believe, um, who was talking during that. I forgot who didn't talk. Oh, uh, Sanko. Sanko was actually covering that fight and she does a great job and she was like, oh my God. So between rounds, they actually fix her up. It's a nasty cut between the, between the eye, you know, between the eyebrows basically. But she goes out, she's not bleeding, does the best she can and eventually loses by TKO at four minutes and 48 seconds in round two. I saw it as, look, she went almost two full rounds. She was badly cut in round one. Showed a hell of a lot of a, you know durability. Showed a lot of toughness. And so from that standpoint, I'm not trying to make fun here. She's a tough ass you know fighter. Her weakness for Courtney King is her boxing technique. Is ugh. and sometimes you see that in lower level fights in general, whether it's women or men. But like you know, just weird punches, punches that have nothing on it, like punches that are like you know just you know weird stuff. Um, and then her inactivity is, is something we got to talk about here. We'll talk more about it, but she has not been very active. Now, for Ramona, pa Ramona Pascal, her big strength is her knees. You could watch the fight 2018 where she fights you know, somebody in a Muay Thai bout, a smaller girl, hits her with a nasty knee, which then leads eventually to a finish. Her boxing technique is not to be desired in the case of Ramona Pascal. Both these two ladies here do not have excellent boxing technique, though for Ramona, I'm sure it's improving. Now, looking here at side-by-side -side comparisons even further, talking about Ramona Pascal first. She is a Chinese fighter. She is from China. She was actually at the UFC um, Training Institute there in, uh, in Shanghai. She was there. She was training. Everything was going well. The problem is when COVID hit, she explains this in an interview, she had a hard time getting fights, had a hard time letting up travel. And so her coaches and her in Shanghai decided it's time to make a move. She moves from Shanghai in 2020, 21-ish to Syndicate MMA in Las Vegas. Um, she picked up her entire life. Um, her interviews, interestingly enough, I want to point out, she barely has an accent. So I'm not sure if she was educated in the West or when she was younger, she was introduced to English, but her accent is non-existent, even though she is from China. So anyway, big move to Syndicate MMA. I think in this fight, the training regiment, the training program, the partners, the coaches, enough for me to actually just side with Pasquale over Courtney King, in my opinion, because I believe that 
the, the environment. Look at her Instagram. She is training every day with some top-level female fighters, and that does make a difference. So um, notable opponents. She fought Janae Harding in uh, 2000 and uh, what year was that? Janae Harding, 2017. Sorry to have that available for you guys. 2017, she fought Janae Harding. Janae Harding, she lost to her by round two TKO, but Janae Harding is three and three in Bellator, so a decent level opponent, right? Biggest positives that I have here, Ramona, pretty good finish rate, okay, for women's division. She's finished three of her last four wins. That is impressive. Again, hard knees, hard puncher, not very quick. My concerns here with Ramona, she's also not very active, averaging just 1.3 fights per, per year. When she has lost, she gets finished. She Both fighters actually have a weird stat. They both have 100% finished rate. So when they do lose, they get finished. They don't lose by decision. Um, she lost to Jennifer Norris in 2017. That's Ramona Pasquale. Jennifer Norris has got a 2-3 and three record. She lost her last two fights and hasn't fought since 2017. So that's where some really questions come into my mind of, like, how good is Ramona? Like, you're losing against very low-level fighters within the last four years, not, you know, not yesterday, but still it did happen. Um, and so questions there about her technique, questions about her striking ability. Let's talk about Courtney King. She's from Colorado, one and two in Invicta, two and oh in LFA and Fury FC combined. Fairly active fighter, averaging 1.8 fights per year. A little more active here than Ramona Pasquale. She fought through adversity in her fight against Harrison. I really do like that. I know it's a tough look. She got blooded up, but I think a lot of other fighters tap out before that and don't make it that far. My concerns with Courtney King, she has had over a year layoff. Her last fight was in November of 2020 versus Harrison. She's been finished both times in her losses against Harrison round two TKO 2020 and against Rincon round 2000, 2017 via TKO. She's a raw boxer. That's a nice way of saying that her boxing technique is uh, and limited power. I don't feel like she has much power in her punches because, again, the punching is weird. The angles are weird. Not loading her hips up. you know. So just, just uh, not a great boxer, not a great striker. Her takedown defense against Harrison um, wasn't great, but then takedown. Har but then Harrison is also a bit of an animal, right? She's so strong, so di difficult to deal with. But Courtney King did not look comfortable. I'm not imagining Ramona Pascal is going to wrestle her either because she's not a wrestler. She's more of a Muay Thai boxer, striker. But still, just pointing out that one of the weaknesses there for Courtney King is her takedown defense. Now, once she was down against um, Harrison, Courtney King could not get back up. Again, will it, pay will it play a role in this fight? Probably not. But if she faces a fighter that takes her excuse me, down, Courtney King has shown in the past she cannot get back up. Excuse me. And then the last note, um, I mentioned it before. She's training at a very small gym. I couldn't find anything in that gym for any other fighters that are training for mixed martial arts bouts or Bellator or anything. So Ramana Pasquale is training every day in syndicate MMA. She's on the gram. Look at her, look at her training partners. Look at her coaches. That is a big factor. She picked up her entire life, left China, came over here to the United States. Her boyfriend recently flew from China to come visit her 7,000 miles. She kind of follows all that on the Twitter. So, look, I think that Ramona Pasquale is the fighter setting up to win the fight. She made the sacrifices. She's doing the damn thing. Um, I think she wins the fight. Courtney King did not show me anything on film that impressed me, other than the fact that she could take a damn punishment, and she's not going to be an easy out, which would imagine to me this fight probably goes a distance, right, where Courtney King, even if she gets cut up and beat up, will be able to withstand most of what Ramona is dealing with. Now, the fight will not get on the ground, I don't believe, and if it does, it'll be momentarily, because, again, for Ramona Pasquale, she wants to be on the feet, Muay Thai's type of fighter, striking is her game. The fights that we watch in these two fighters to break down this film, we watch... King versus Harrison 2020, that link's in the description. We lost Pasquale versus Guzman, that link's also in the description. And then there's also another fight there where it's Pasquale versus a 2018 opponent. It's a weird fight. Take a look at the description, you'll see the fight there. So side-by-side -side comparisons, last few things here. Experience-wise, again, both a one and a five. They have very little experience. Seven fights for Pasquale, six fights for Courtney King. IQ-wise, I give a small bump there for Mona Pasquale because of the move. You know, it doesn't mean she's a better fighter. But this concept of picking up your life and moving 7,000 damn miles around the world to pursue something after you were already in the UFC program in, in, in uh, China, so you were or someone they were investing in already, um, just shows to me a high, you know, high level of um, you know, thoughtfulness, looking to make big moves in your career. Cardio-wise, very similar. Both fighters have looked good in later parts of their fight. And uh, finishing-wise, I give a small edge to Ramona Pasquale. She does have a few more finishes here than Courtney King. Has good hands, though I don't think she finishes Courtney King in this fight. Boxing-wise, low grade for both fighters. And grappling-wise, a low grade because I just haven't seen enough on film. I just don't know. So I would encourage you guys, if you're listening to this, this breakdown here and you know anything else about Ramona Pasquale or Courtney King, please comment. Please give me your feedback here because there are a lot of variables. I'm taking the 33-year-old Ramona Pasquale to win the fight from Shanghai. But or Hong Kong, I'm sorry, but she, to me, has a lot of holes in the game. I would imagine her next opponent after this, for example, I would be you know very cautious about wagering on Ramona because this is a good opponent for her. It's a good setup for her, 
But ultimately, um, there's holes in the game on both sides. This is pretty low-level mixed martial arts for women's MMA. It is the fourth fight on the card. Um, so maybe should have been down a little bit lower. Anyway, the point is, at minus 130, Ramona Pasquale, there's value there. At plus 100 for Courtney King, I guess there's more value there, but you really got to like her. And what's your reason for liking her? So I'm on Ramona Pasquale out of Cindy Kevin to win the fight. I like the recent moves in her, in her career. I think she wins the fight on the feet by decision. Not going to prop bet this event at all. So don't worry about prop bets here. We're just talking about winners and losers. And straight up, Ramona Pasquale should win the fight. That's a breakdown, guys. Good luck with this fight. Next up, we have the co-main event in the Bantamweight division between two American fighters, Monica Fearless Franco versus Haley All Hail Cohen. Cohen's 5-2 overall from Waco, Texas, about to be 30 years old. 5'9 height with 71 in reach. She trains at a Blitz Sports MMA. As for Monica Franco, she's 2-0. This will be her third mixed martial arts professional fight from Hawaii, 37 years old. So late start to her career. 5 to 6 in height, so, so 3-inch uh, disadvantage there in height for Franco. 63-inch reach, an 8-inch reach advantage there for Cohen. That's going to be a factor. We'll talk more about that. We'll come back around to that point. Franco is training at Underdog MMA. According to Tapology, it looks like the public votes are coming in on Cohen with 85% of the votes here for Cohen, 50% of the votes here for Franco. I agree. I like Cohen to win the fight. I think that she has several advantages, including obviously the reach advantage there on the feet. Now, looking at their fighting styles, Monica Franco is a bit of a Thai kickboxer. She's got a wide stance. Um, gets very awkward at times on purpose. We'll do a lot of fainting. She used it in the fight against Pettigrew, her last fight about a year and a few months ago, where she um, used it just to basically get Pettigrew off balance. And then she'll strike. You know, she'll throw a weird punch. Again, she, her arms are kind of down at times. She'll throw punches from her hips. So she has a very unique style, you know, some kind of it like a Stephen Thompson a little bit part of it. I'm not saying she's that good of a fighter per se, but she's got a unique uh, Thai kickboxing stance style. Haley Cohen is more of a natural kickboxer by stance. She reminds me a little bit of Ronda Rousey, reminds me a little bit of Holly Holm, kind of like a mixture of that. Stands tall, but has her, her chin chucked, uh, chuck, tucked in, which is good. Likes to be heavy in the back foot because she wants to throw a kick. Um, sharp, quick, quick striker. Faster, quicker on her feet than Monica is. In terms of the strengths for Monica, her footwork, her footwork is very good. So again, she could be very awkward. She's in a circle. She knows how to move away from um, from her opponent's strikes. She used it well again in her prior fights to set up opportunities with her opponent and to keep her opponent off balance. For Haley Cohen, one of her strongest suits is her striking power. She does have some finishes. We'll talk more about that here in a few minutes. But her striking power is her strength. She can hurt her opponent or if at the very least back her opponent up and get her opponent to respect her power. The weakness for Cohen, her grappling. She's been submitted. She's been in fights where she's been winning, makes a mistake. Next thing you know, falls into a guillotine, and that happened to her in her most recent fight when she lost. Um, for Monica Franco, I'm not sure good how, her how good her grappling is. She showed good takedown defense recently in her, in her fights. But the one thing that I don't love is the boxing technique. I don't like the boxing defense. Um, I don't like the boxing overhand looping strikes everywhere. I mean, if some of those things land, they could be powerful. But I question how much power she has in her hands. So I think boxing-wise, the 37-year-old Monica Franco is at a big disadvantage here compared to Haley Cohen, who's throwing straight strikes down the pipe. Again, similar to Holly Holm. She's not as good as Holly Holm, but she's got that kind of technique. You know, very nice, well-rounded technique. Looking here at some notes that I have on the fighters. For Monica Franco first, she is from Hawaii. We mentioned it. She's got two pro fights, three and eight as an amateur. Usually the amateur experience is not a big deal, but she was submitted five times as an amateur. Five of her eight losses she was submitted. So I have to question how good her grappling is, right? 1-0 in Invicta. She's got a black belt in Taekwondo, and I think that's part of where the stance comes from, you know, the, the wide leg, um, maybe Taekwondo-esque type of stance. She does not have any notable opponents. Again, only 2-0 in her, her mixed martial arts pro, pro career. Didn't fight anyone notable as an amateur, and she was 3-8. and eight. Most, most of those losses were against uh, fighters that were below 500 in terms of the winning percentage, so not great there. She is undefeated as a professional. we got to give her that. She is 2-0. and oh. Uses an awkward stance, as we mentioned before, which can be an, a unique technique to keep her opponent off balance. I'm sure she'll do it again. Her dirty boxing game was what I found to be interesting. As the fights went on, her most recent fights, when you watch later in the fight, when she's against the fence, good elbows, good hammer fists, She's flexible. Um, she did a good job in there versus Pettigrew, especially late in the fight. When Pettigrew was getting tired, she was busy against the fence. Showed some good dirty kickboxing. So um, her cons or the, or the negatives that I have here on Franco, not very active. Um, she's had a long layoff. She hasn't fought in exactly one year in 11 months. So it'll be almost two years now when this fight comes around. So big layoff. 
She had a five-year layoff between her last two fights. <laughs> so like three fights in like six, seven years. You know, I'm just calling it what it is. So, um, and she had a one-year layoff between her amateur career and her pro career. So anyway, a lot of layoffs there. She is 37 years old. Um, almost all eight of her amateur losses, like I mentioned before, were against fighters that are below 500. Her boxing technique, it's not to be desired, as we mentioned. And I also thought that I saw her get fatigued in her last fight. Again, it was a while ago, two years ago, but it seemed like she slowed down a lot in round one. Granted, she came down later on in the fight, like a second win. But late round one, she seemed to be the tired, more tired fighter. So I'm going to look to see what that's like this fight. It's been a long time for her since she's been in the octagon. Maybe she's been training a lot. Maybe her card is okay. But she is older now, 37. That is, that is a factor. Now, for Haley Cohen, I could talk about her for days. She's a former gymnast from Texas, like state champion, ends up graduating from high school, but doesn't go to college for gymnastics, goes to Baylor University and signs a scholarship for tumbling. They have a tumbling acrobatic program at Baylor University. Not to be confused with cheerleading. It's not the cheer program. It's an actually different, cool, different program where it's tumbling. There is some like unison stuff and, and choreographed stuff too. It looks a little bit like cheerleading. Point is she goes to University of Baylor for that. After college, she ends up getting into mixed martial arts, but she references her prior you know, career as a gymnast as a kid in college, being a scholarship athlete. So she's got a lot of mental focus, very disciplined, comes from a very religious family, has a bunch of like basically priests and pastors and, and all kinds of people on both sides of the family, men and women. And so she's also to a very religious person. So her last fight was canceled. She was going to fight, had a terrible weight cut, had to be hospitalized. It was pretty dangerous. She learned from the experience. She's bouncing back from that. Her, her experience before that was a loss. She came off of a loss, and we'll talk about that. That was a loss to Kelly Clayton. In that fight, she's doing well. She seems to be winning, and she gets popped. And as she gets popped, she falls down on her back, but she's she's fine. She kind of rolls right away very athletically back to her feet. When she comes to her feet, Kelly locks in a guillotine choke. It was perfectly done by Kelly, and unfortunately, uh, Haley could knock it out of it, and she loses. I think a learning experience, round two, guillotine choke. You know, before that, she was on a five-fight winning streak after losing, losing her pro debut. Um, a lot of talent with Haley. I mean, her striking ability is nice. It is amazing. You'll notice it when you see it on film. She's 5-2 and two in LFA with three finishes. Notably, three finishes, all right? So she had three finishes, like, in her last five fights. Very impressive. She was 3-0 and oh as an amateur. She went pro in 2018. She's a southpaw, which is always unique for another opponent. And her style, her kickboxing style, it's nice. It's aggressive. It's nice to look at. She has a nice frame, very well balanced, really good, just well proportioned physique. Her positives, the thing I like a lot about Cohen here, she's been an athlete her entire life, as we mentioned. Good takedown defense. Okay, you notice that in her film. She's not just a tall fighter who can't defend takedowns, she can defend takedowns. She's a natural striker. You cannot tell she wasn't boxing or doing some kind of combat sport as a teenager. She looks like she was doing some kind of combat sport. That's probably a reference to the gymnastics, which is a very technical sport. She talks about it. We put an actual link in the, in the description there for an interview with her where she talks about her background, similarities that she sees between gymnastics and mixed martial arts, especially the techniques and being specific. Anyway, um, last thing on her that I like, a very aggressive fighting style. She's not like rushing in, but she's setting the tone. She's walking down her opponent. She's got her, her chin chucked, tucked down. She's leading the dance. You know what I mean? She's aggressive. My concerns for Cohen. She's she's gotten she's gotten uh, situations where her like her last fight where she lost by uh, submission. If you watch the film, it wasn't just a submission at the end. She was fighting off submissions prior to that. Um, she was fighting off an arm bar in the prior round where the you know pretty much the, the clock ran out and she got saved by the bell. So. Submissions tend to be a weakness for her. I'm not sure it's going to be a big deal here against Franco, uh, but something I noticed about her on, on film. She is coming off of a loss, so she has not won a fight in almost two years. So technically, Haley Cohen has not won a fight since March 2020. That's literally almost two years. So it's nice to get back in the win column, but sometimes when you haven't won a fight in a while, you forget what it feels like. So she needs a, she needs a win here. She's only faced very low level competition. That goes for both fighters, obviously, but it's 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 hard to sort of gauge who's the much better fighter here when they've both fought low level fighters. When you watch film, even the last loss for Haley Cohen when she lost her last fight, before the loss happens, she looks good. She's sharp. You know, she she's piecing up Clayton at times. She's throwing kicks. She's throwing body kicks, throwing combinations. She looks fluid. So I think personally you've got a, a big level disparity here. I think Haley Cohen is the much better striker. How can Monica even the playing field? Maybe she grapples her against defense. That's where I said before Monica's good at. A dirty, you know, dirty boxing is her thing. 
you know, close the distance, eliminate that 8-inch reach advantage, keep her in close. Because if the fight stays for any kind of normal amount of time, 2-3 minutes around at distance, you can see how easily Haley Cohen's going to be able to piece her apart and probably walk out of here with an easy 3-round victory. So, all that said, I do like Haley Cohen. I've said it before, I'll say it again. At minus 240 in the money line, I think she's one of my... Favorites in the card, um, if not my favorite overall. At minus 240, I'll parlay her a tad bit. I'll take her for a unit and a half to maybe two units. You know, side by side, their experience level, about the same IQ level, about the same. Cardio-wise, I give a slight edge to Haley Cohen. She's looked better, and she's fighting more recently, even though it's been a year for her, but it's been almost two years for Franco. Finishing-wise, definitely an advantage there for Cohen. She's got some finishes recently. She shows he's got finishing power in her hands. Boxing-wise, big advantage for Cohen over Franco. And then grappling-wise, I think it's even. I think Monica's an okay grappler. Haven't seen her be an elite-level grappler. Haley Cohen is okay at defending takedowns. She could do a little wrestling, but when it comes to submission defense, not great. So we put two links there in the description for two prior fights of these two fighters to look at that we looked at first for film study. And then we also put two links there for news. Uh, actual, I'm sorry. It's, uh, it's an interview with Haley Cohen with a reporter and another one is like a little mini story about her college experience at Bell University and like an interview with one of her coaches, whatever else. So that's the breakdown for this fight, guys. Good luck with this one. Um, I think this was going to be one of the ones that most people will probably be siding with Cohen. I imagine that money line, which is sitting right now at minus 240, is probably going to explode to somewhere around minus 350 to minus 400 by the time the fight comes around because Haley Cohen, I think this is all in terms of all set up for her to win the fight. You know, I think she goes to six and two. Want to see her be busier. She's got goals. She has aspirations for, aspirations for Monica Franco. After this fight, she'll be due for like another four or five year layoff. So next time she comes back, she'll be like 42 years old. So anyway, good luck with this fight, guys. We're up to the main event. It's going to be a title bout between Alicia Zapatella, the current champion, defending her belt against Jessica Delbani, the second. Now, these two fighters squared off back in May of 2021. We'll talk about that fight. This is also an atom weight championship fight. Does not exist in UFC or Bellator. This is a small division, 105 pounds. But you know what? It makes sense. Invicta is a female-only mixed martial arts promotion. So with that said, you will notice very early on if you're watching the fight live or if you haven't watched these guys fight before, uh, the referee will look somewhat tall because these two are very, very small fighters. Again, just 105 pounds, standing at about 5 feet, 5 feet 1 um, in each case of the fighter. So Alicia Zapatella. Defending her title here, she comes in with the nickname Half Pint. Makes sense. Nine and two overall, four one of her last five fights. She's from Michigan, twenty six years old, four foot eleven in height for her, so she's actually not even five feet, sixty inches. Um, so again, her reach is not great, but it makes sense. She's shorter. Scorpion fighting system is the gym that she trains out of. As for Jessica Delbani, eleven and three overall, the Brazilian is four one of her last five fights. She hails from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, twenty eight years old, five foot one in height. So you will see in their prior fight if you watch that film. There's a slight height advantage there for Delbani. And the reach, I do think it's more than the two inches. Um, it says 62 inches compared to 60. I think Alicia may even have a shorter reach than 60 inches because there's a noticeable reach advantage when they're standing up and they're boxing. Um, as for Delbani, she trains out of Parnara Valatudo. Okay, looking here at Tapology. Tapology has Zapatella winning the fight. 79% of the votes are coming in for Zapatella. Only 21% of the votes are coming in for Delbani. Now, granted, that's only 155 total votes. Um, so... We'll talk about this fight here. I'm going to gloss over some basic stuff on each fighter and then try to hone in on why I do believe Delbani wins this fight. Um, the first fight was a doozy. We'll talk again about that in detail, but let's go over some background information of both fighters. So Alicia Zapatella, interestingly enough, I put a link in the description for you guys to listen to a prior interview of hers not that long ago. She did a very good interview, talked about just sort of her upbringing, was playing soccer, playing a variety of sports, playing softball. At one point, one of her softball coaches was like, you got to stop doing the wrestling thing because she's wrestling, right? She's a girl. She's a wrestler. The softball coach is like, stop the wrestling thing. You know, boys wrestle. Do a sport like softball where you have a future. And she was like, oh, really? She quit softball, stuck with wrestling. So from the age of five years old, from a very, very young age, she's been wrestling, won over 100 matches throughout her high school career. Um, 
was very into it, you know, sort of for like, you know, her calling card. She did play other sports in high school, like soccer, but wrestling was really her love, her passion. She talks about in her interview, beating up boys and seeing them crying and seeing their parents and, and the dads trying to encourage, you know, their sons to beat up on her and whatever else. I mean, just the whole gamut. I can't imagine what it's like being a female and wrestling, and you know, pre pretty much a predominantly male sport, right? So she talks a lot about that, but it shows the character. She's an out from under. She's an underdog. She appreciates that, you know, that position, that role. She's also talked about how when she's done fighting, she wants to stay with Invicta. She wants to fight only in her career in Invicta. She actually wants other fighters to come over and fight with her or against her in Invicta. But she doesn't want to leave Invicta. She wants to do broadcasting when she retires. She loves the promotion, on and on and on. Okay, so with that said, she did have an amateur career, 2-2-1 two, two and one overall. She lost a decision as an amateur to Cynthia Arceo. Not a, not a big-time name, but Arceo lost her last fight in LFA, 2021, to, to, to uh, Vanessa Demopoulos. Now, Demopoulos is fighting on UFC Vegas 46 cards, so just kind of like a six degrees of separation. So again, she lost a decision to Cynthia Arceo, not a terrible fighter, back as an amateur. She's been a fro, uh, excuse me, a fro, a, poor, a, four, a pro for four years now for Alicia Zapatella. Her favorite fighter she mentioned in an interview was Yuri Prijashka, and she said mostly because of the spiritual stuff. So outside the cage, he talks about spirituality and, you know, meditation and just, you know, the whole body, the mind, everything. So she was very fond of that, and she said she likes his fighting style as well. She's 6-1 in Invicta, okay, um, and she has no intention of leaving, as, as I mentioned. She's 0-1 in Ryzen. She did suffer back-to-back -back losses in 2019, so about two years ago, three years ago, she lost to Kana Asakura, who's 18 and six overall, and Vivian Pereira, who's 14 and three overall. Now, as I mentioned, this is a, this is a rematch. They fought back in May of 2021. In that fight, okay, in that fight, Alicia got the fight by decision. I'm going to talk about this for a second here. In my humble opinion, I don't believe that she won that fight. When you watch the fight, not only do I think that you know uh, she lost the fight. The broadcast seemed to believe the same thing. Um, it just appeared as if the, the judges, for some reason, were valuing uh, <clears throat> her attempts to get takedowns. But I kid you not, she must have attempted at least 15 to 20 takedowns over the course of five rounds and did not get a single one of them. It, it, maybe one was close. The point is they were easily defended, and on the feet, it seemed as if Jessica was the one landing the sharper punches. It just seemed that way to me. But she gets a decision win, and that's notable because of her last four wins, two of those have been a split decision wins. So she's kind of on that edge there of losing fights where, for some reason, you could also argue that the referees are seeing the positive side. They're giving her those fights. Well, I shouldn't say giving. They're giving her the benefit of the doubt. She's earning the decision, right? So in that prior fight, she could not take down Jessica. Jessica did a phenomenal job defending her. If Jessica had changed one thing in that fight, I would have said a little more volume. And at times when she was landing a strike or two or landing a jab, she would back away. She has this thing where she would be backing away from the engagement instead of finishing it off, you know, and landing a few more strikes. So it ended up being close, yes. But in my estimation, she lost that fight against uh, Jessica back in May. So um, recently she's winning as a favorite. So notably, check this out. Against Delbani, she was a minus 145 favorite. She won by split decision. Against Cummins, Cummins, a former UFC fighter, 2-2 two two in the UFC, I believe, is what Cummins went. Cummins was minus 170 as a favorite going into that fight, and she won that fight via round four submission. Now, if you watch the fight against Cummins, that's against Cummins and, again, Alicia Zapatella, that fight, she's losing the fight. And we know that she's losing because, again, they have a live scoring system. Shout out to Invicta. That's awesome. Live scoring system shows that she's down in the fight. It is round four. In round four, she does a great job of taking down Cummins, good wrestling, gets into a nice Von Fluke choke position, executes the, executes the choke, and gets the win. But had she not submitted the fight in round four, and obviously said to if, she was losing the fight. Her prior fight, minus 150 favorite against Von Zant, and that was 2020. She won that fight by split decision. So her last three fights, two wins by split decision, and one where she needed a submission or a finish of some kind to win late in the, in the fight, and she got it. So just putting it in context, her most notable opponent, and that's, again, for Alicia Zapatella. She defeated Vivian Pereira. And that was in 2019 Invicta via decision. Now, Pereira is 2-2 two two in the UFC. I misspoke. I said Cummings was 2-2 two two in the UFC. That's misspoke. Correction, it's Pereira. She defeated Pereira again by decision back in 2019 um, in Invicta. The biggest wins of her career for Alicia, beating Lindsey Van Zandt by split decision in 2020. Um, and Lindsay has a win in Bellator, so good opponent. And then beating Ashley Cummins. Uh, Cummins, she beat her by submission in round four. Again, as we talked about, Ashley has a win in Bellator too. So those are both Bellator level fighters that she you know, she beat recently, 2020. Uh, so about a year and a half, two years ago. 
her positives. She does have a submission win over Cummings, and again, Bellator level fighter. So she has a recent finish. That was one of her last, what, two or three fights. Um, finishing wise, she's not an amazing finisher. Neither fighter is, but again, it's 105 pounds, right? Put that into context. Um, for Alicia, she is a more active fighter here than Jessica. Alicia's averaging just about two and a half fights per year. Excellent cardio. She's been to nine rounds in her last two fights. A five-rounder decision and a four-rounder where she ended the fight in the fourth round. So excellent cardio. She's lighting her feet the entire fight. She knows how to circle and stay away from damage at times. Um, so for Alicia, I think her cardio is, you know, off the charts. Um, she does use her wrestling well to get into submission situations. And she's a good wrestler. Again, we talked about that in the beginning. So for her, her wrestling is effective. And she used it, for example, against Cummings to get into position to go ahead and finish the fight. Against Jessica, unless there's some kind of a major difference or a hiccup in Jessica's game, she could not take Jessica down at all in the first fight. It ended up being very futile for her to try to take her down. So with that said, some of the concerns I have on Alicia, a low finish rate, as I mentioned, only two career finishes. Again, small division. It makes sense. This probably goes a decision again, five rounds. She's got a significant reach disadvantage, and that's probably in all of her fights. But in this particular matchup, it's noticeable. You saw at times that she was missing basic kicks or basic punches and was having a hard time sort of closing the distance or figuring it out. And that was into round three or four of the fight. Again, not sure how she won that fight. Not sure the judges saw that. That was a, a very odd situation. It went into round five, by the way, tied, which was like a lot of drama. So in going into round five, the judges had it like 38-38, however that works out in the scorecards, but they were all the same. So everyone had it, you know, dead even. And in that final round, I mean, I guess it was close, but again, I thought Jessica landed the better punches. Her head was very high up on a perch, easy to punch, easy to hit. I thought Jessica did not take enough advantage of that in the first fight, but it was there and available. So a lot of times in that fight, even though you like the movement in the lower body for Alicia, that she's moving side to side, that she's circling. Her head does not do a lot of side to side movement. It's right there for the taking. At times, Jessica was able to easily land, land some dip jabs. Now, over the course of five rounds, 105 pound fighters, it wasn't like Alicia had a lot of damage to her face, but she had some swelling and some, a little bit of redness. You know, Jessica was getting to her little by little. She didn't land a lot of big shots, but she was landing some clean jabs and some straights. All right, um, one more thing. In their first fight, uh, Alicia did not defend the leg kicks at all. I thought the leg kicking game alone would have separated Jessica in one or two of those rounds that they gave it to um, Alicia. The judges just didn't see the leg kicks, didn't even take it into mind. But she did do a little bit of a job there on uh, Alicia's front leg. So in this matchup, will Alicia make an adjustment? Will Jessica double down and do even more of that? Not sure. Now as for Jessica, she's Brazilian. No amateur career. She's been a pro for double the amount of time, eight years. Now they lost in the first fight, as we mentioned, okay? She likes to walk down her opponent. She reminds me a lot of Amanda Lemos. If you've watched Lemos fight, Lemos is like this intimidating, heavy-footed, a lot, of, a lot of weight in the front foot, kind of just walks you down, you know, with a side angle. She does the same thing, uh, which means her front leg is open to kicking damage, but that didn't happen in the first fight. But that's just her stance. She's kind of, um, you know, very aggressive stance and walking flat-footed. She was able to... I wouldn't say close off the cage against Lisa the first time, but when she wanted to, she was able to get in there and, and exchange with her. We're going to talk more about that in a second. Some of the deficiencies I felt that I saw in Alicia's, or I'm sorry, in Jessica's game in the first fight. So um, they both fought Ashley Cummings. So again, Ashley Cummings has a Bellator win. Alicia won by decision and Jessica lost to her via decision. So interesting again, Jessica Dalbani lost to Cummings and Alicia won. So if you're doing MMA math, that's another point there towards Alicia. Um, 2021 Invicta champion, that's Jessica Delboni. She was the champion before then she ended up losing to um, the belt to Alicia uh, Zabatella. So notable opponents here for Jessica. She beat Julia Palestri via TKO in 2019. That was two years ago. Palestri just lost in 2021 on Dana White's Contender Series. So just a little bit, you know, against six degrees of Kevin Bacon or separation or however you do that. But Julia Palestri is her most notable win. And again, by TKO, 2019, about two, three years ago now. I have to use to saying 2019 is not two years ago. It's not 2021. It's 2022. Anyway, the positives here I like on uh, Alicia Zapatella. I'm sorry, on Jessica are a very active fighter. Okay, now when I say active, her mixed martial arts activity is not as much. She's averaging just about, uh, for Jessica, she's averaging about a fight and a half a year in terms of mixed martial arts. But when it comes to, for example, grappling and other forms of, of combat, like kickboxing, whatever else, she has fought six grappling bouts in 2021, two mixed martial arts bouts in 2021, two exhibition bouts in 2021, and one kickboxing bat, uh, bout in 2021. So literally, this woman was in some way, shape, or form competing in some way, some level of art um, in 11 different um, bouts in 2021. So 
She's active, very active, and clearly has a grappling game. Will not look to grapple, though, here against Alicia. The first time around, they just kept the fight completely on the feet. I expect that again here from Jessica. Um, I love that Jessica controls the pace of the fight. I thought that was another reason why she should have won the first fight was she controls the pace. She controls the center of the octagon. She pushes the fighter in whatever direction she wants to go with. So you know, I thought that was positive. I thought it was, it was noticeable in the first fight. She's got a good winning percentage, 11-3 and three overall. Obviously, one of those losses here is against Alicia. Um, she started her career off 9-1, and one, so very, very hot start to her career. Now she's dropped a few in her last you know few fights. Very solid chin, I thought, in her fights against um, her last few fights. It wasn't just this fight against Alicia, but she also, we watched film against when she fought, uh, excuse me here a second, looking at her topology, Lindsay Van Zant. all right? Not that Lindsay Van Zant's an amazing fighter. She's 7-5 and five overall, but the point is she got hit a few times there, showed a very good chin. At this weight class, 105 pounds, I think this Brazilian fighter, Jessica Dabani, doesn't respect the power of any of her opponents. She will walk them down. Um, she did that in some of her recent fights, and it makes sense. Again, I don't think she's worried about getting hit too much. I think she wants to get in close, land some shots on her fighter. Now, she defended all the takedowns again in the first fight. I expect her to do that again here against uh, Alicia. And maybe one takedown comes through, but I think she's going to defend those takedowns. Now, my concerns here on Jessica Dabani. She's lost two of her last three fights. She does have a low finish rate as well. She's got only one finisher in her career compared to Alicia. And meanwhile, she's been a pro for eight years compared to four years for Alicia. Um, her boxing defense is not awesome. Now, am I worried Alicia's going to like crack her, knock her out? No, Alicia's got very poor boxing and tends to throw really off-balance shots, loops, overhands, doesn't have the reach to get in there. And so with Jessica, though, she has her hands up. They're up. But the guard's open, so it's like you could just probably punch right through that. If you had, if she fought a better fighter with a better jab, it could be a problem. Now, what else do I have here on uh, our girl here, Jessica? Jessica, okay, so here's one specific thing, if you could follow me on this, okay? When Jessica engages with the person she's fighting with, specifically when they fought Alicia and Zapatella, Alicia versus Jessica, the prior fight, back in May, not even a full year ago, right? She would step in, this is Jessica, she would land one or two punches, and then everything that she was doing as she was tailing off the end of the combination, she's backing up as she was doing it. And it wasn't once, it wasn't twice, it was consistent. Now I'm thinking, is this because she's being trained to come in, land a few punches, and then back out, and that's not worse strategy, you're trying to get in and out, don't take too much damage, don't stay in the fire too long, right? Or is it because she's worried about taking some more damage? I, it just didn't make sense because a few times I, I get the technique of coming in and out, but it looked like if she just stood there for one more second or finished through and followed through and, and, and stepped forward in her last few punches that she would have ended those exchanges on even a better note because she's fighting a fighter in Alicia who's already backing up. So if you can imagine, they would, they would engage for a second. Jessica could land a nice, maybe even land a shot or two or nights, and then she's like backing up and disengaging, and then you've also got Alicia backing up and circling. So I just felt like if the, if she could make a small correction there, she maybe wins one or one more of those rounds in that prior fight and gets the actual win, or maybe she puts you know um, Alicia on her heels a little bit. Alicia, we watched the prior fight of hers, not just this fight. We watched the fight against Ashley Cummings. In that fight, Ashley Cummings nails her in round one. Now, in the defense of Alicia, she stands with it. She's able to recover and keep going. But she kind of buckles a little bit. She's there for the hitting. Her, her head is up high. It's available. Some more notes I have here on the two fighters side by side. Experience-wise, you got 9-2 and two versus 11-3. and three. In my opinion, they both fought comparable level competition. Their experience level is the same. IQ-wise, I also have them pretty much even. Cardio-wise, I already mentioned, these girls have gone deep into fights. They both fought each other five rounds. They both look very fresh in that fight. I give them a very high rating for cardio. And again, at 105 pounds, you know, they're just smaller athletes. They're not going to, you know, burn through as much energy as like a 265-pound, you know, UFC heavyweight, right? So finishing-wise, again, very low-level finishing ability because 105 pounds, women's, it, make, it makes sense. Boxing-wise, significant advantage to Jessica Dalbani. When you watch the prior film, and please do the links in the description, as always, we provide links in the description for our fights that we talk about, that we break down, so you know we're not just talking out of our ass. We're giving you breakdowns based on the actual film that we've watched. So with Dalbani, um, her boxing is just sharper. Again, reminds me a little bit of Amanda Lemos. Um, just has that similar style. Just would like to see a little more, a little more action, a little busier. She's got to finish her combinations on a, on a higher note. Grappling-wise, I want to say Delbani is better at jiu-jitsu because she's like, what, how many grappling tournaments she did last year? Six grappling tournaments. And I think she went five and one in those grappling tournaments. So she's decent at it. But at the same time, Alicia Zapatel has been wrestling since she was, you know, five years old. She does have a submission recently by Von Fluke, Von Fluke choke. So she can do it. She can, you know, and, she, and that was against Cummings, a decent fighter. So when it comes to grappling, I got to give them about the same. And that just depends on what happens. If Jessica gets taken down, Alicia gets some top position. 
it could be the difference maker in this fight. So with all that said, I like Jessica Delboni to win the fight. I think what ends up happening here is the money line reflects very similar to what the first fight was like. So now what we have here is Zapatella is a slight dog at plus 110. That's what we have currently. It could change before the fight actually comes out. But I think it makes sense. Most people who watched that first fight will acknowledge Jessica Delboni probably won that fight. I think Alicia Zapatella, a lot of positives. Love the girl. Love the interview. Watch the interview. The link's in the description. You can see what she's like. A lot of positive things about her. Jessica Delboni, too. Her post-fight interviews, su you know, super enthusiastic, on, you know, high on life, positive, thanking all of her coaches, her teammates. You know, just a lot of positive vibes. This is going to be a good fight. I imagine both fighters after the fight's over are going to be shaking hands, very respectful to each other. But for Jessica Delbani, if she can tweak one or two things, she wins the fight. For Alicia Zapatella, she's going to have to not just tweak. She's going to have to take a gigantic crank at a few things, as in getting Jessica Delbani down. She was not able to do it in the first fight, and she kept trying. She tried through the entire final part of the fight, all the way through round five, and could not make it happen. So this comes down to, does Alicia, the wrestler, former wrestler, wrestle Jessica? Does Jessica on the feet take advantage of the exchanges and continue to look cleaner? Because if it's just a boxing match, I think Jessica Delbani wins the fight. I'll be wagering on the event, and I'll be putting at least a half a unit straight up here on Jessica Delbani. My concern, and the reason why I'm not going a little harder here on Jessica Delbani in the main event is because it happened to her already. She kind of won the fight, based upon my opinion. Judges didn't see it that way, and so maybe they're not seeing her fights the way that I would see it. And so I fear that if this fight gets close again... We get to the end, and then maybe Alicia does get one takedown. The way they gave her the first fight, it leads me to believe that if Alicia gets one takedown in one of the rounds, like pff, that round's for Alicia, they might give her 10-8 round. You know, I never know. So I'm being sarcastic, but the point is, bet this with caution because we saw the first outcome. That was just about seven, eight months ago, and it didn't come out so clean. So with that said, I like Jessica Delbani to win the fight. I'm not outside the realm of possibility of thinking that she could TKO Alicia. She has hands, but she just didn't show that pressure in the first fight. So I'm thinking by decision, minus 140 in the money line for Del Delbani. It should be plus money by decision. See what your books are offering. Good luck with this one, guys. All right, so that brings us here to the end of the breakdown for Invicta FC 45, Zapatella versus Delbani. This is their rematch from last year. I'm going to go over each fight real quickly as a summary as to the fights that we like and also pinpoint the fights in the fighters that we like the most, right? Starting at the top, uh, Alicia Zapatella, the main event versus Jessica Delboni. We're going to go with Delboni. Not a high level of confidence. It's my opinion, my humble opinion, that she did win the first fight. We'll see what happens this time. I do think that she has some athletic advantages. I think if she just a little uptick in the volume, takes this fight here over Alicia Zapatella, who is a very good champion, has a bright future. I don't like going against her because she seems like she's a very, you know, quality person. Anyways, down the card, co-main event, Haley Cohen versus Monica Franco. Now, here's a pick I do have a lot of confidence in, and the money line suggests that. At minus 240, Haley Cowan's almost a two and a half to one favorite over Monica Franco at plus 190. I like Haley Cohen. I just think she's superior, a uh, smarter fighter at this point, um, you know, sh displaying better technique in the actual octagon. I know Monica Franco's 2-0, but hasn't fought since like Nam. Weird, you know, breaks within her career. And I just think Haley Cohen is it right now. The Blondie's going to come in here and get it done. I like Haley as one of my most strong, or if my strong, if not my strongest pick on this card to win outright on that money line. Next down, Ramona Pasqua at minus 130. We like her to win over Courtney King. And yes, we have a high level of confidence here. Maybe not as confident as Cohen. But approaching that level of confidence that we really like Ramona Pascal to win the fight. Um, I think the move to syndicate MMA is, is awesome, significant. Um, I think she's making all the right strides. I think Courtney King is going to be a little overmatched here in this fight. And so I'm on Pascal to take this fight here. Next down, Maria, I'm sorry, excuse me, Maria Jose Favela, Favela, Favela versus Sarah Kleska. I should have said this in the breakdown. I didn't get to it, but Favela actually has a meaning. Favela, if you look it up, if you just wiki it, favela is actually a Portuguese word, Portuguese term. It means a, su a slum in Brazil, like a ghetto in Brazil, favela. When I first heard the name Maria Jose Favela, I'm thinking, where do I recognize that terminology from? I got friends from Brazil, friends who speak Portuguese. So yeah, kind of a unique nickname. Now, Maria Jose Favela is Mexican, so it you know it's just a Mexican last name for her, but it does mean a ghetto in, in Brazil. Anyway, so Maria Jose Favela at minus 310 is supposed to win the fight on the money line, but we're going with Sarah Kleska at plus 250 as our lone dogger pass pick on the card. I don't have the world of confidence. Maybe a quarter unit to a half unit is what I'll put on it, but I'm a little concerned at minus 310 to put money behind Favela 
Both fighters have holes in their game. We talked about it. I'm going with Klesga here at plus 250. Going on down to the second fight in the card, Tabitha Ann Watkins at minus 125 versus Katie Sal. Tough one for us to break down. We ended up with Katie Sal's to pick at slightly plus money. That's not the reason why, but I guess we're getting some plus money there. Tabitha Ann Watkins, a very unique record. We talked about it. Has, you know, three amateur wins, three pro wins. Never defeated somebody with a better than 500 record. Um, so just a very interesting background there. We will see what happens here. Katie Sal. Not like she's lighting it up either, but we'll see what happens at plus 105. I'm going to take my chances with Katie Saul. At most, at most, a quarter unit to a half unit. Not going to be parlaying this piece. And the first fight, Helen Peralta. Now, this is a parlay piece. This is a piece that I like a lot, and I will I will talk about the parlay in just a second. But Helen Peralta at minus 350 is my, is my suggested guesstimated range of what the money line will open up at. I don't have a money line on it yet. Minus 350. Going back on the other side at plus 185 for at least Pone. I just think that Helen Peralta is up and down, more experienced, better fighter, has the more quality wins, yada, yada, yada. I would parlay with a lot of confidence, Haley Cohen, Ramona Pascal, and Helen Peralta on this card if your book were to offer it. And if you're going to add another piece after that, then I would put Je I would put Jessica Delboni. And then the very last two pieces would be Sarah Klesga and then Katie Saul. But I would stay away from the Katie Saul, Sarah Klesga, and De Jessica Delboni as parlay pieces. A lot more risk there. Um, so anyway, that's the full card breakdown, guys, for Invictus 45. This was our first breakdown for an Invictus event, and uh, it was pretty cool. I, I got a chance to follow some fighters or at least get do some research on fighters that I didn't know very well. And so we'll be doing some more breakdowns as the year goes on for Invictus. And, and look, it's an opportunity to get to know some of these fighters who either have fought, possibly UFC before, or in Bellator, vice versa, or maybe working their way up. And in the case of like Cheyenne Bays, I did know that she fought in Invictus before. Um, or Invicta before, but I didn't really actually know as much about it. I didn't see her fight as much. I, now I watched some film on her. Sorry if I Helen Peralta. Sorry to get a loss there. And so look, there's fighters that are on this card possibly in this event for Invictus, uh, Invicta 45 that are possibly going to be maybe in the UFC in the near future. So with that said, thank you for joining us. If you haven't done so already, you know what you're supposed to do, right? I got to tell you, please like and subscribe. All right, guys, we'll see you soon. If I didn't say so already, happy new year. You look good. You look good in new year. You're looking sharp. You know, you're looking sweet. Talk to you guys soon. Peace.